Hey, it's week 15 fantasy football, and there is a lot on the line heading into the fantasy playoffs. I mean, making the right choices this week, it's harder than a pair of nipples during the winter time. But we're going to do our best to make the right calls this week and win some championships. Hit the like button. We're breaking down every matchup right now. What is going on, Headliner Nation? Jake Fancy Headliners. Hopefully everybody's doing well out there. Welcome to Week 15 Fantasy Football, where today we're talking running backs, who we starting and who we sitting. Now, it doesn't really matter if you're fighting for a championship or you've been eliminated and you're just trying to play spoiler. You still want to make the right calls here. Play the entire season. Don't just give up the last couple weeks regardless. End on a high note. And that's what we're talking about today is what are we going to do going into Week 15? There's some tough choices out there. There's some pretty obvious ones, some good matchups, which we're looking forward to here in the playoff time. But there's also a few decisions that we may need to make here together. Now, we're going to get into all the Week 15 matchups. But before we do, once again, we're going to see how we did in Week 14 here for the running back position. Now, before we get into those numbers, just a quick reminder, don't get overly caught up with what column these guys are in. Every league is different. Every team is different. Some teams are stacked. Some teams are not. We're talking 10-team leagues, 14-team leagues. It doesn't really matter. Listen to the information that's provided and use that to help make your decision. Don't just watch the video. Find out what column I have somebody. Take it as advice and then do it and then get pissed off if it doesn't work. We're trying to make sure we make the right decisions together. So take that information and, and hopefully it makes your decisions a little bit easier on Sunday. Now, let's see how we did here last week in week 14 for the running back position. For week 14, we basically killed it at the running back position. We had a total of 54 players that we gave a start or sit designation to that completed their games here this past weekend. Out of those 54 players we talked, 40 of them were correct for an accuracy percentage of 74%, our highest of the year at a great time there week 14. Some of our biggest hits, Austin Eckler. Dude went out and had over 200 total yards. Huge game. Raheem, not quite a must-start moster last week. Maybe heading that way here starting this week. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, Devonta Freeman, he had himself a great game, found the end zone, had him as a start last week, same with Philip Lindsay, could have had a huge game, but had a second touchdown called back. Uh, Aaron Jones, we know what he did. He went out and obliterated the Redskins. All those guys were listed as starts last week, all performed. Some of the biggest misses, Mark Ingram had himself another letdown game. Miles Sanders didn't do a whole lot on Monday Night Football. And David Johnson, we had him as a sit dude, went out and got a touchdown. How much is that? That's a you know, steaming pile of crap right there. Sony Michelle continues to underwhelm. And Jamal Williams is expected maybe a little bit more usage, but it was pretty much all Aaron Jones this past week against the Redskins. But overall, a great week for the running back position. We're going to try to do it again here this week in week 15. There's a lot on the line, and I've gone through as many pieces of information and research as I can to try to provide as much as I can to you guys to help make these decisions a little bit easier. So now let's get into week 15 and find out who we should start and sit. Thursday Night Football, Jets and Ravens, and just a couple of weeks ago, Le'Veon Bell, Mark Ingram, both weekly must-starts for your fantasy football team. But are they still this week? That's the question. Just last week in Week 14, Le'Veon Bell missed his game due to an illness. However, dude felt good enough to go out and go bowling. He bowled great, by the way. But now rumors are coming out that they're going to be shopping him there in New York over the offseason and potentially trading him. There's one issue with that, though. He hasn't really lived up to expectations as of late, so they're not going to really return much value in a trade for him. How do they boost that trade value? By giving him the ball a lot here the last few weeks to show potential teams that he's still got it. Now he has a matchup going up against the Baltimore Ravens who allow right around 17 fantasy points per game to opposing running backs. The biggest question mark here, does he get game scripted out? Do the Ravens jump out to an early lead and really they can't rely on the run in Le'Veon Bell? Now in the past, that was okay. We would just live with the receiving volume that he would get, but that's not really been there this year either. He's only had one game out of his last eight games where he's had more than five receptions. Not the same old Le'Veon Bell. Maybe they force feed him the ball here to end the season, and he ends the season on a high note and helps you win a fantasy championship. He's still going to be in your lineup. We're just lowering expectations a little bit and keeping our fingers crossed for that excess volume. Now for Mark Ingram, he's struggled for the last couple weeks, but he's had matchups going up against San Francisco and Buffalo, so tough matchups, but... Now that the Baltimore Ravens have, you know, punched their ticket to the postseason, do they kind of pull back the reins a little bit on Mark Ingram and make sure he's healthy for a postseason run? Entirely possible. Maybe Gus Edwards gets a little bit more run. Still up in the air exactly how this is going to play, but the volume has still been there. It's not one of a tough matchup. The Jets do only allow 16 fantasy points 
to opposing running backs, but this is the Baltimore Ravens offense that can run on absolutely everybody. He's still averaging right around 17 touches over his last three games. Now, he's going to be in the starting you know, column also. Now, am I going to lower expectations a little bit for him too? Yeah, probably. I mean, the volume may still be there, but it's still somewhat of a tough matchup. A Thursday night game, I don't love those. But he has that touchdown upside every single week on a team that can find success running the ball against anybody here in the NFL. They're both in the star column. Gus Edwards, Bilal Powell, they're going to be sits right now until we can figure out what type of usage these guys are going to get down the stretch. Moving on to Sunday, Patriots and Bengals up now. And I'm officially ending the Sony Michelle experiment here for 2019. Not worth a start here anymore. He's had some great matchups, done absolutely nothing with it. For some reason, they bring him out early. They pound the ball to him here early and... Then they basically abandon him rest of game. So not going to deal with that headache here anymore in 2019. He's a perma sit in the sit column. Now, James White, he's really the only option that I trust right now in this backfield, as long as you're playing in a PPR style format. Cincinnati allows 21.7 fantasy points per game, the seventh most in the NFL. Now, outside of Julian Edelman, the next best option in this offense consistency wise has to be James White here once again. He's had 33 touches over his last two games. He's a solid PPR flex. Now, he's not going to go out there and have huge numbers rushing and huge numbers receiving, but he's a solid floor. He's going to go out there and get you right around 10 fantasy points as a floor every single week. Sometimes, especially now in the fantasy playoffs, you need a little bit of that, that, that consistency in your lineup. It allows you to maybe take a gamble somewhere else if you have to. So he's really the only guy that I would start for the New England Patriots. But what about Joe Mixon and the Cincinnati Bengals? Is he going to continue his second half surge? Can he do it against the New England Patriots? The New England Patriots who are still the number one defense against opposing running backs in fantasy football, giving up only 11 fantasy points per game. Over their last four games, they're only giving up on average 69.75 rushing yards per game to opposing running backs. They haven't allowed a rushing touchdown to a running back since week nine. This is not an ideal start for Joe Mixon whatsoever. It really depends on what options you have on your roster. He's a decent flex play, but there is risk involved this week. The part that I do like, he's going to go out there and get the ball close to 20 times. There's not too many running backs in the NFL that you can really say that about, so it's really hard to bench him. Just a tough time to have this matchup. So I have him in the start column. Uh, It really depends on what other options you have, but the volume is there, and he has that that flex play potential here for me in Week 15. Bucks and Lions up now, and this one's going to be pretty short and sweet. Let me ask you a question. It's the fantasy football playoffs. Do you trust Ronald Jones or Peyton Barber at this point? If you say yes to that question, please don't sign up to play fantasy football next year. You'd be better off without it. I don't trust any of these guys in these backfields on either team you have a banged up Bo Scarborough now how much volume does he get and does it even matter he's going up against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers run defense was just a hair below what the New England defense is they only allow 11 fantasy points per game also there in Tampa Bay a bad matchup for the Lions backfield and if Scarborough is limited at all what type of touches do we see for Ty Johnson or JD McKissick it's up in the air now Marvin Jones has been placed on IR they can focus even more on the running game I mean there's just not a whole lot of options here to really work with a lot of risk and none with which I want to take here especially week 15 in the fantasy playoffs Texans and Titans up now, and at this point, I'm willing to make a sacrifice for Headliner Nation and donate my hamstring to Derrick Henry so he can please be on the field on Sunday. We need him in our fantasy lineups. A little bit of a scare last week. He left the game just before halftime. He came back out and played and played just fine, but we need to make sure we pay attention to these practice reports and injury reports throughout the week. Let's make sure he's a full go because we need him in our lineups once again. He's extended his 100-yard rushing streak now to four games. The Houston Texans allow over 20 fantasy points per game to opposing running backs, and both of these teams are still playing for something. They're tied for the division lead. They both need this game. They don't have that luxury just to say, ah, we're going to sit Derrick Henry. We really don't need him. Don't want him to aggravate anything. No, they do need him, and we need him also into our lineups. Just can't sit him here at this point. But for the Texans, it's really hard for me to trust Carlos Hyde. I really want to. The volume is there. But the efficiency is just not. He's only had 10-plus fantasy points two out of his last seven games. Now, Duke Johnson, if you play in a larger league, larger than 12 teams, isn't a bad flex option in PPR leagues. He's had at least six targets in each of his last two games, but he gets no volume on the ground to really give him that safe floor. 
The Titans allow just over 18 fantasy points per game. And if I'm in one of those larger leagues, I'll take a shot on Duke there as a flex, maybe a multiple flex league, then maybe. But Carlos Hyde is just too much of a risk, too much touchdown dependency. And if he doesn't get it this week, I can't afford to take that hit in the fantasy playoffs. Broncos and Chiefs up now, and I loved Phillip Lindsay last week, and I do again this week. I mean, he could have had a huge week last week. He found the end zone for the first time in a few games, but he actually had two touchdowns. One of them called back due to a holding penalty. He could have had himself a monstrous game, and I love the matchup just as much this week. He's averaging right between 16 and 20 total touches on a weekly basis, and he's sharing less and less with Royce Freeman every single week. Right now, the Chiefs allow 24 fantasy points per game to opposing running backs. That's third most in the NFL. Love Phillip Lindsay once again, and I'll start him with confidence again this week. As for the Kansas City Chiefs, not overly you know excited to start any of these guys. Damian Williams, he's still banged up. LaShawn McCoy hasn't seen more than 12 touches in a game since week seven against the Denver Broncos. Darwin Thompson, he's kind of friend zoned at this point. I mean, he's just stuck in single digit hell. He can't get out of that. There's just too much going on in this backfield. And we already know that Patrick Mahomes is going to throw the ball quite a bit. The last time these teams played, LaShawn McCoy had 12 carries for 64 yards, two catches for 12 yards, no touchdowns. I mean, he's the volume just isn't there. Damian Williams isn't 100% healthy, healthy. Darwin Thompson's just kind of hit and miss. None of these guys worth the risk, in my opinion, here this week, going up against the Denver Broncos in the fantasy playoffs. The epic clash of the Dolphins and Giants up next. And man, I'm old enough to remember when Saquon Barkley was good at scoring fantasy points. But lately, he's just been a huge disappointment. But wait, maybe this is the time where he starts to redeem himself just a little bit, at least over the next two weeks. He's got matchups over here the next couple weeks against the Miami Dolphins and Washington Redskins. Both allow more than 20 fantasy points per game. This week, going up against the Dolphins, who allow almost 22 fantasy points per game. The volume is still going to be there for him. He's going to get you close to 20 touches on a weekly basis. Maybe with Eli Manning under center, he can move the ball down the field through the air, at least for a half of the football game, and it could open up things for Saquon Barkley. It's a good matchup. There's volume there. He's been a disappointment, but you're rolling with him against the Miami Dolphins. Now, on the, the Dolphins side of things, you have Patrick Laird, and a lot of people love to talk about Patrick Laird, and deservedly so. He's had 33 touches over his last two games, back-to-back games, with at least 10 fantasy points and half-point PPR scoring formats. And there's a lot of banged-up pass catchers there for the Miami Dolphins. We know Devontae Parker, fantasy Bigfoot, Albert Wilson, the you know, concussions just going out and like crazy. And Miami, everybody's concussed in Miami. Maybe they need some more pass-catching options. Insert Patrick Laird. He could have some increased volume and and potential value here in week 15. If you're in a deeper league looking for a flex play, I don't mind Patrick Laird at all this week. The the New York Giants gave up on average 18.6 fantasy points per game. I'll start him as my flex spot here in week 15 and hope for that added volume in the passing game. Eagles and Redskins up now, and the Philadelphia backfield is just too much of a headache for me to want to deal with here in the fantasy playoffs. Does Jordan Howard return yet? Miles Sanders, I mean, he kind of got outplayed by Boston Scott this past week. What goes on in this backfield? It's an actual problem for fantasy players, not so much for the Eagles because they have options. But for us in fantasy football, it makes it almost impossible to figure out whose week is it going to be. Are we going to see a lot of Boston Scott again? Do they go back to Miles Sanders heavily? Does Jordan Howard play and steal all the goal line touches? There's just too many question marks, and we really don't know which defense is going to show up for the Redskins. The ones who just limited Christian McCaffrey two weeks ago to a below-average Christian McCaffrey-esque game? Or do we see the defense from last week who got absolutely obliterated by Aaron Jones? We just don't know. Too many question marks. I prefer to avoid the Philadelphia backfield altogether. Now for the Redskins, no Darius Geis, right? Which means what? Yep, more Adrian Peterson. So he's going to be seeing right around 20 touches a week, which is pretty, pretty consistent what he's seen all year long with Darius Geis out of the lineup. Yeah, Chris Thompson, he'll be sprinkled in at times, but it's a difficult matchup for him this week going up against Philadelphia. They only allow 15 fantasy points per game. But ask yourself this question. At the end of the week, if Adrian Peterson scores anywhere near 15 fantasy points per game, will you be happy? The answer, more than likely, with all the injuries and other problems this week, you'll probably be happy with that. Not saying he's going to get every single point in that backfield, but even if he goes out there as a flex play and scores 12 points, Not a bad week for Adrian Peterson if you're in a bind, and he's somebody that we know is going to get the volume. Not a whole lot of other options in that backfield to take away a chunk of volume. So the opportunity is going to be there. 
Hopefully he can get a goal line carry or two to give you a solid fantasy day. I have him as a start here in week 15. Seattle, Carolina up next. And this one's pretty straightforward, but what an emotional roller coaster it's been for Chris Carson. Owners here over the past couple weeks, they went from having a great feeling. They had a running back one to that uneasy feeling of, man, does this guy lose touches because he keeps fumbling the football and Rashad Penny's playing pretty well to now absolute fantasy euphoria because there is no more Rashad Penny. The stud running back one of Chris Carson comes back and it comes back at the best time possible. A matchup against the Carolina Panthers who give up over 27 fantasy points per game to opposing running backs, the most in the NFL. A perfect time to start Chris Carson. He may actually be inside my top three in my rankings here this week. Love the matchup. Love the volume he's going to get. Could be a huge week for Chris Carson there in the Seattle Seahawks. For Carolina, you got Christian McCaffrey. Yep, you're going you're, you're gonna to start Christian McCaffrey. Chicago and Green Bay up next, and Aaron Jones had himself a huge game last week, as expected. We saw that one coming. Uh, went out there and probably won, won a lot of people their fantasy matchups in Week 14. There's no way you can really sit this guy with the ceiling that he has. He can win you your fantasy matchup all by himself. And he's going against the Chicago Bears. They give up over 18 fantasy points per game. And now Jamal Williams has seen his total touches decrease over the last three straight games. Are they starting to rely a little bit more on Aaron Jones down the stretch, possibly, especially maybe in this divisional game, which they could really use in the win column. I expect a heavy dose of Aaron Jones. Once again, he's going to be a start for Chicago, David Montgomery. It's like the weekly question mark, right? Everything can look great on paper, and the guy can go out there and lay an egg. Everything on paper can be like, nah, I don't want to touch this guy, and he'll go out there and play decent. You really don't know what to expect from this offense or David Montgomery in the running game. The the inefficiencies are starting to pop back up now. He's dropped all the way down to three and a half yards per carry on the season. He's only had one touchdown over his last five weeks. But this is a great matchup once again on paper against the Packers. They allow 22.1 fantasy points per game. I don't love it. I'm worried about starting David Montgomery, but the winter months in Green Bay... It's kind of when more teams start to rely on the running game due to possible bad weather. Now, it's still a little bit too far out to know what the weather's really going to be like on Sunday. But David Montgomery has some flex appeal once again this week. It's a great matchup. He should see 15-plus touches total. You know, if they continue to keep it on the ground, if they need to get him more involved in the passing game to really give him that safe floor, I don't love it. Uh, But I'll start David Montgomery as a flex play this week just due to the matchup alone. As for Treat Cohen... He's seen single-digit touches now for two straight games. He's too boomer bust, too hard to trust, not utilized enough in this offense consistently for me to want to start him here in Week 15. Vikings and Chargers up now. We're not going to get too cute here with this one. Dalvin Cook played last week despite some injury concerns, but escaped the game without any further injury. He's had at least 10-plus fantasy points every single game this season. Now he gets a matchup against the Los Angeles Chargers to allow about 20 fantasy points per game. He's going to remain in your lineup no matter what. Now for the Chargers, I mean, Melvin Gordon and Austin Eckler kind of remain must-starts on a weekly basis. Minnesota is a difficult defense to run against. They're top 10 in defense, allowing only 16.4 fantasy points per game. But Melvin Gordon, he's had at least 10 fantasy points in every single game since Anthony Lynn took over play-calling duties, and Austin Eckler is playing out of his mind. He had over 200 total yards last week. This sounds absolutely crazy because it's Austin Eckler. But on the season, this guy has over 1,300 total yards and 11 touchdowns. You can't bench either one of these guys. The usage is through the roof on a weekly basis. Anthony Lynn loves his running backs. And despite the matchup, can't bench either one of these guys. Jags and Raiders up now. And boy, did Leonard Fournette pick a bad time to struggle last week in week 14. In fact, last week... In week 14, he had his fewest receptions in a game since week 7, and that's really what's given him that safe floor on a weekly basis. It wasn't there last week, but now he gets a matchup with the Oakland Raiders who give up just about 20 fantasy points per game. Now, Oakland, not really the type of offense to go out there and blow anybody out, right? So this game should remain close, which is perfect because the closer the game is, the more Leonard Fournette you see. I'm looking for a bounce-back game. He's an obvious must-start here this week. But what about the Oakland Raiders? The big question mark, Josh Jacobs, does he play? If he does play, is he limited? Is he on a pitch count? Does he go out there and, you know, try it out the first half and and realize he can't go? Heck, what if he only goes the first couple series and then he has to sit down? The guy has a fractured shoulder. Why risk it getting any worse this year with Josh Jacobs? Just start to rely a little bit more on DeAndre Washington, maybe. 
I mean, but no matter what happens here, we want to start a running back against the Jacksonville Jaguars. They're giving up 24 fantasy points per game, second most in the NFL as of right now. In my opinion, as of today, DeAndre Washington is just the safer play. We need to pay attention to the practice reports and the injury reports to find out what we hear about Josh Jacobs. I kind of expect him to sit again. That's what should happen here in Oakland. And DeAndre Washington played great last week in his absence. He had 20 total touches, 96 total yards in the touchdown. And that's more than, you know, good enough to go out there and produce huge numbers this week against this Jacksonville defense. All things just add up to resting Josh Jacobs and not risking further injury. In my opinion, as of today, Washington is the better play. But we'll have to wait here till later in the week to find out what the status of Josh Jacobs really is. Browns and Cardinals up now in another typical week here for Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt. They're finding themselves in the start column once again. Now, Chubb's volume, it's still there, and so are the rushing yards. It's the touchdowns that haven't been there for him, and it's really just bad luck. Look at last week's game, for example. Had a huge run, got them down inside the five-yard line. He was winded. They pulled him out of the game. Who scored the touchdown? Kareem Hunt. Those are just the type of things that, that are happening to Nick Chubb here that's really preventing him from having a really high ceiling on a weekly basis. But he still is over 1,500 total yards on the season, playing great football. Arizona, they allow right around 19.5 fantasy points per game to opposing running backs. And Kareem Hunt continues to remain a solid flex play, especially in PPR leagues. His volume is a lot lower than Nick Chubb's. These guys are coexisting just fine together. But Hunt has had three straight games with touchdowns and has had at least six targets in every game since his return here to the Browns. I'll start both of these guys here this week once again. For Arizona... No, thank you. You got Kenyon Drake, who hasn't had a touchdown or more than 80 total yards in a game since he joined Arizona in week nine. That's the last time it's happened. And then last week, a fluke touchdown to David Johnson, who all of a sudden, for a play, decided to be fantasy viable once again. Neither one of these guys has been consistent at all, and I'm not trusting either one of these guys in a matchup in my fantasy playoffs. Despite the matchup going up against Cleveland, who allows over 18 fantasy points per game, I'm not willing to risk it on either Kenyon Drake or David Johnson here this late in the season. Way too boomer bust, in my opinion. Rams and Cowboys up now. Another one of these games that's pretty straightforward. The volume continues to be there now, second half of the season for Todd Gurley. And the Rams, they're finally starting to play a little bit better football on the offensive side of things. Now, he's had at least 18 fantasy points in three out of his last four games. He scored touchdowns in three out of his last four games. And Dallas is allowing just over 17 fantasy points Per game, Jared Goff starting to move the ball down the field a little bit more, mostly to Robert Woods, catching like 812 balls over the last few weeks. But that's helping Todd Gurley out in this running game. If you got him, you're starting him. For Dallas, I shouldn't have to tell you to start Ezekiel Elliott either. He's had four straight games with at least 15 fantasy points. Dallas at home in a must-win game. They need to rely on Zeke, and I'm expecting more than 20-plus touches in this game. Both these guys in the start column. Falcons and Niners and the San Francisco 49ers continue to show us why they're one of the most creative offenses in all of the NFL under Kyle Shanahan, especially after their victory last week over the New Orleans Saints. Now, the San Francisco 49ers, they may be approaching must-start Mostert territory. Yeah, that's a thing. And he was all over the field last week, and he has been for the past few weeks. He's out touching Matt Breida and Tevin Coleman, who's basically non-existent. I would like to think there's some type of revenge game here for Tevin Coleman, but he's just not seen any volume to trust at this point. Over the last three games, Raheem Mostert has 35 carries for 260 yards, five receptions, 70 yards, and four total touchdowns. Right now, he's the best option in this backfield, and Atlanta gives up on average right around 17 fantasy points per game. San Francisco needs to keep winning, and right now Raheem Mostert seems like their best option in the backfield. Now for Atlanta, I really want to start Devontae Freeman, right? Calvin Ridley, he's done. He's on IR. Julio Jones, not 100%. He's banged up. Maybe a little bit more passing work for Devontae Freeman. That's what we really need to see to give him that safe floor, because it's a tough matchup going up against San Francisco, who allows only 12 fantasy points per game to opposing running backs. He needs that passing work to be a safer play. I'll gamble with Devontae Freeman a little bit this week. More than likely, you have a few other options on your roster at this point. If you can afford to put Freeman into your flex spot, I absolutely love it. There is risk associated with it, but the touches could be there. The increased volume could be there, and I'll take it here in Week 15. 
Bills and Steelers up now, and Devin Singletary continues to grow into this Buffalo offense. Yet another week with at least 20 touches this past week, and now he's had 12 fantasy points at least in five out of his last seven games. Tough matchup, yeah, I know. The Pittsburgh Steelers only allow right around 15 fantasy points per game, but what really helps Devin Singletary is his efficiency. He's still well over five yards per carry, and will continue to get more and more touches in this backfield. Frank Gore kind of being phased out, it seems. And they need to continue to win games in Buffalo. One of their top playmakers right now, Devin Singletary. And I'll start him here again in Week 15 in a difficult matchup. Now for the Steelers, I don't know if I'm willing to risk it. Does James Conner play? Benny Snell is highly inefficient. Really needs a touchdown, so maybe standard leagues only. I, mean, I don't really want to risk it with him in any type of PPR type scoring. I mean, this isn't a horrible matchup, but the Buffalo Bills defense has been playing, you know, improved over the past few weeks. Jalen Samuels, he's still involved, but not getting consistent touches. I mean, maybe if James Conner plays and practices 100% by the end of the week, he's an option. But if he doesn't, honestly, I'm avoiding everybody here in this backfield this week. Monday Night Football, Colts and Saints up next. And Marlon Mack owners were so happy that he returned. Unfortunately, he returned to a couple difficult matchups last week against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. This week, he gets the New Orleans Saints, who only allow 14 fantasy points per game, fourth best in the NFL. Now, we kind of saw last week that Drew Brees and the Saints, you know, came out to a very hot start, putting up yards and points all over the place at home in New Orleans. Does that happen again? If it does, Marlon Mack may kind of be game scripted out of this because they don't really involve him in the passing game very much. He becomes really touchdown dependent at that point, but they're committed to him in the running game. He's going to get you right around 15 to 20 touches in the game. And this isn't really a slouch of a defense on the Indianapolis side of things. I mean, we've talked about Alvin Kamara, who continues to struggle. He disappointed again last week. Only had 43 total yards. Worst game of the season last week. I mean, heck, Latavius Murray even had 94 total yards on only nine touches last week. But like I said, Indianapolis, not a slouch on defense. They're actually fifth best against the run. That's only one spot below the Saints. This is a very capable run defense. You can't afford to really sit Alvin Kamara, though, at this point. I mean, you kind of want to ride your studs here in the postseason. If you bench Alvin Kamara and this is the game that he goes off and you lose your fantasy playoffs because of it, you'll never let it go. You'll be pissed at yourself for months. That's not something which I'm willing to really take a risk on at this point. Both Mac, both Kamara. Limited upside, limited expectations, but still in the start column. We're crossing our fingers. We're saying prayers to the fantasy gods. This is the week that we need one of these guys or both of these guys to come through. All right, those are my starts and sits for the running back position here. Week 15 fantasy football. Let me know what you think down below in the comment section. Now, once again, don't get too caught up with what column these guys are in. Take the information provided and use that to help make your decisions on your teams. I'm not setting your lineups for you. We're trying to make those decisions just a little bit easier on Sundays. We know there's a lot on the line, and we want to try to bring home as many championships as we possibly can to Headliner Nation. So we appreciate the support. If you have questions down below, ask them. Myself, somebody in the community, we will do our best to get back to you and open up those conversations to really help each other make those best decisions possible here for Week 15, looking for those championships. The season is almost over. It's gone so quick. We greatly appreciate that support. Don't unsubscribe from the channel if you lose. We go year-round. We are not going anywhere. Yeah, we'll talk majority of football, but we have a lot of great plans coming up here for 2020, so stay tuned for that. We greatly appreciate you, like I said, and we'll talk to you later.